So we looked at position sensors, we looked at light sensors, and now we're going to actually look at a proximity sensor. And some of the sensors use light sensors, even though light sensors themselves are analog, right? You understand, but we got a basic feel now how it could easily be turned from what analog over to uh, digital. So a sensor, we all we know what a sensor is now. This is going to be on quite a few slides, so it's a high probability that this is going to be on the table. But what's the sensor between a, so a sensor is going to take a physical stimulus and convert it over to an electrical equivalent, right? What does a transducer do? To, from one to another, right? So, so a, a photoresistor would be a transducer because a photoresistor does not give an electrical output. It gives us a change in what? Resistance. Now we can easily change that to but the guy's not giving us a voltage output. We we add a we add a fixed resistor in series with it, and we can get a voltage out of the whole sensor right now. In a control system, what are the things that we want to sense? We've already looked at this, so we've already talked about position sensors, and I don't have light in red. But so what we're doing now is looking at uh, so this guy here should be red, and once we've gone over so far. Proximity can in, uh, sensors indicate the devices at a certain place. So uh, we have limit switches, we have magnetic reed switches, optical proximity sensors, hall effects, and capacitive inductors. These are the main categories of proximity. A limit switch is a proximity sensor, but we don't use limit switches have been around since controls have been around, and they have they we call them limit switches. So when we use, uh, we, we have two broad categories of sensors. Uh, we have what we call contact sensors and non-contact sensors. So a contact sensor has to make physical quant uh, contact with what it's trying to measure. So some of our temperature sensors are contact sensors. They're, they're actually mounted on something. They're buckled down so they can actually melt amount uh, the temperature. Uh, so what it, over time has come into play is we have we use limit switches, and when we use the term proximity sensors, we're talking about these guys right here, the what non-contact. So that's that's what it is. Uh, the example I use is uh, for years and years, and it's still what we do is. Uh, for years, computers ran disk drives. And if you load your main operating system off a disk drive, that is what we call, we call a disk operating system. Well, so just about 90% of the operating systems out there are disk operating systems. But the first one that came out, we called it DOS. And so disk operating system was the acronym. So it became known as DOS. So when the other oper disk operating systems came out, we don't call them DOS. We call them Windows, we call them Unix, we call them Linux, we call them all these other names, even though they're all what? They're all disk operating systems. So that's the same thing true here. So limit switches were the first one used, and we call them limit switches, right? Because normally they were originally used to find when things hit their limits. Uh, so when these non-contact sensors came out, uh, you know, we started to call them proximity sensors. So that's so when we use the term proximity sensor, even though a limit switch is a proximity sensor, we don't call it a proximity switch, or we call it a what? A limit switch. And all the non-contact sensors, which means they do not make physical contact with what they're measuring, uh, we call these proximity sensors. Everybody okay? So uh, uh, magnetic ray, all these are non-contact sensors. Magnetic ray switches, optical proximity sensors, hall effect sensors, and capacitive adjustments, these are non-contact sensors. And we, uh, this is most people don't include these because we call these switches, but these are proximity sensors, right? You understand that? Because they're sense, they're sensing a proximity of what? Who? 
You, yeah, you had to push these things, and you have to flip them. So these are these are these could actually be called proximity sensors, but we don't call them proximity sensors because they're what? They're mechanically operated. Yeah, push buttons or switches. These are all selector switches, uh, toggle switches. These are pro technically they're limp, they're proximity sensors, but we don't call them that because of what? They're contact sensors, right? And these guys have been around forever too. They got their own name. When you um, are you playing a like, sensor? What do you like mean? I, um, like I have an old stereo over the top of the CD and I thought about that. Little, little black thing going in. It's a, it's a, it's a laser. Look at that, Tosh. How do you read it? How do you read it? It does it off the collection. Why do you keep so what a uh, what the surface of a disc is a CD or DVD a DVD and a CD work off exactly the same principle. All they did all they did on the DVD is, is decrease the spacing between what we call the pits and the lanes, and then they added more tracks. But but what they do is uh, they've got pits and lanes. So if you ever could get a big magnifying glass and looked at that little surface, you'd see all little things like this. And what they do is they shoot a laser, shoot a laser off, and then it bounce, and it's it's at an angle, and then the receiver is at an angle. So what happens is that it comes over here and hits this, and it would bounce up and see it. If you're over here, it'd come over here and hit this, and it would come off at a different angle, and the receiver would miss it. And that's what that's the way DVDs work. That's the way CDs work. And DVDs and CDs work on exactly the same principle. It's just that the, when the laser technology got better and the beam could get smaller, they could move the pits and lands what? Closer together and make them higher densities. So, yeah. Um, and uh, a Blu-ray is, is not, Blu-ray is not, it's, it's just a DVD, but the video is encoded digitally different. Than, it's compressed differently than they do on a regular DVD. So he uses a different compression technique, higher resolution. Higher resolution. Uh, video is always compressed now. It, we, we can't deal with actual video. Video takes up thousands and billions of bytes of information just to do one line of color. So everything we do now is compressed. So uh, Blu-ray uses a different, it, it allows more information to write, be represented by the bits. Does that make sense? So compression techniques for video has been around years and years and years. Huh? Yeah, it is. It's what we call it's what we call a uh, it's what we call a diffuse sensor. It depends on reflective light. Well, with the, it reflects off the surface. Well, we call these definite reflective, in that uh, they only sense light at a precise distance. It's just like most of our optical mice right now are they if you ever look you can actually see the laser is at a it's not a laser but that it's actually at an angle so if you pick that mouse up off the table just a hair it don't work anymore because it's expecting that surface to be at a exact distance and that's what this guy is right here this it's expecting those bounce back to be at the exact distance if it's not at the exact distance then the receiver don't see it and that's we call this a a definite reflective, uh, retro reflective sensor. Or diffuse sensor, I'm sorry. So, I've got me off on a tangent here. So, we, uh, uh, so a limit switch is an electromechanical contact device. It must make physical contact with the object. The part of the limit switch that makes the physical contact, we call this the operator, we call it the actuator. So it's going to be some type of arm sticking out there. It's going to be some type of little knob sticking out there. Uh, we got limit switches up here. I don't have any electronic duty uh, limit switches in my bag, I don't think, but I got some I can bring. But all y'all have that, all of y'all have had motor control. But one of the labs that can get motor control is get a limit. Yeah. So that thing you see sticking out, of course, that's the operator. This is a heavy duty or what we call a pilot duty. These guys right here are designed to run low. 
So the contacts are going to be big. They have they can handle quite a bit of current. So what's what a heavy duty or, or a pilot duty limit switch uh, will allow us to do is actually run loads. Uh, then we have what we call uh, electronic duty switches. These guys are not designed to run loads. These the guys are designed to give us a voltage or not a voltage that we would input into a PLC or something like that. And let the PLC make the decision. So pilot duty, use the switch higher currents in voltages, usually contain several contacts, and these guys are going to be large in size. More and more, the more we move into uh, allowing computers to run uh, to make our decisions and be able to control, more and more we're moving toward uh, uh, electronic duty. A lot of times they'll actually have a big operator on them, right? You understand that? Uh, these guys are, are a pretty good, pretty high price, and that's another reason about electronic duty. They're very, they're very expensive. The only uh, advantage that, uh, another advantage of a heavy duty, these guys are big, so they can contain several contacts. Uh, when we get into these pilot duties, these little old tiny ones, uh, they're usually going to have either a single post, single throw, or a, a single post, double throw switch. A lot of them have a single pole. pole. Y'all understand that, right? Everybody okay with single pole? Okay. So here we've only got basically one set of contacts that we can work with. But we can definitely take the output of that and feed it into a PLC. And a PLC, you can use that same contact hundreds of times because it's all computers. Everybody understand that? So these are limit switches. Uh, these are this would be a heavy duty, a pilot duty. Uh, we have the rotary, which is this type, and then we have the plunger <coughs> type, the left actual limit switch element, which is the slow type. And then we come in and we'll put a lower on that thing, or we'll, we sometimes we actually use it. We we'll use a lever, we we'll use a rower, or whatever we need to do. So the plunger would probably have a rover on it, right? Uh, these other guys would have a lever, and a lot of times they'll put a rover on the end of that and they'll reduce friction out there and make that limit switch actually work better. Pretty easy to see how they work, right? Notice they have a snapping egg. Uh, they, they actually, it takes, it takes a, uh, they have a hysteresis or an activation curve. So as soon as you move, they don't activate instantly. And once you hit that point, you don't, it's not a slow switch. It, it moves across a plateau and snaps because uh, the longer we take to make the contact, the more likelihood we're going to have to get arcs. And if we get arcs, it's going to pick, it's going to pit our limit switch, right? You understand, and co could cause the, the contacts to weld together. This is a whisk. I've seen these guys counting, so they're very small, very thin. And every time it comes by, it just knocks this thing out of the way. And we, we use a lot of those for counting. They use them in the, uh, you have saw them in the bottom of the bottle, in the thing. Oh, yeah, so they, yeah, same thing. So they'll have this guy, this sensor right here, and they're using a regular limit switch, but I'll have this, this guy right here. And, uh, when they throw the basketball, they go over there, when it goes through the hoop, they'll activate the little switch. Give them a score. Probably now they'd use photo sensors. Uh, this is electronic duty. These guys are really, really small. Uh, usually the actuator you buy it with the type of actuator that you want. So this would be a roller, this is just a, a plunger type. They all activate just about the same way. Uh, these are going to be really small. They do not handle a lot of current. So if you input into a PLC, a PLC input don't, don't hardly need any current at all. We could probably look up on the data sheets for a PLC and see how much current is uh, required by the input, but it's usually very low. But what you got to understand is once you bring that into a PLC input, you go ahead PLC. Now PLCs, we bring in an input into an into an input port, and then when we get into the program, we can use that same address for that input port as many times as we want to. And so you can make a, a switch that's got one one contact on it appear to have what well, thousands <laughs> by just just by just programming it in.
Uh, this one, I've got these two guys. Uh, like I said, I don't, for some reason, these are called hollow, these are called reed switches. And a lot of times you don't actually see the reed switch. It's going to be encapsulated in something. But the way the reed switch work, we have two types. You don't run into the mercury uh, much at all. But the way, the, way, the way the mercury works is we have two sets of contacts. And what is mercury, by the way? It's a metal, but it has an extremely low melting temperature. So it's it, when we see it, at the temperatures we see it, it's already a what? It's already a liquid. But it's a metal, and most metals are good conductors. So what we can do is we can have a set of contacts, maybe on one side, and then we can put this in a, usually in a glass chamber, unfortunately. And then whatever is going to do, it comes over here and moves this, and it slants it, and then the, the mercury comes back here and covers that up, and it makes the contact. Or it might be, here's a set of contacts right there, so as the mercury moves back and forth, it's going to go over the contacts. If you looked at an old uh, uh, air conditioner, uh, I think that's over there too. Okay. That's the problem with having teaching classes in different buildings. Yeah, I do have this one. So this is uh, the originally the way the thermostats uh, worked inside a house. So they use the mercury switch. But you still might run into one of these. And so what we have is we have a uh, what we call a bimetallic strip. What what happens when we heat up metals? And what happens when we cool metals? They expand or contract. What we do with a bimetallic strip is we took, put two metals together. We bond them together. And each one of them have what we call a different coefficient of expansion. So that means when you heat them up, they're either they're going to try to twist or untwist, right? So in the old days, what they did is they used a calibrate, they used a bimetallic strip right here, and it's in a coil. So what happens is when we heat it up, it's going to expand. It would try to cause the coil to unwind. If we cool it down, it would cause it to do what? It would cause it to contract. So what we could do is we could use that, and what we're doing right here is we're changing the spring tension on the on what's it what's it what's keeping it in the in the in the in the spiral or letting it come loose, right? You understand? And then what would happen is at the top we have a, a what type of switch? Mercury switch. And you'll watch it's got two terminals right here, and then it's got one that comes over to the other side, and it's got two terminals on that side right there. So one of them would work for heat, and the other one will work for your air conditioner. Very neat, right? So what happens is when this thing heats up, it would come out of the loop, and it would cause the mercury switch. So what happens is it breaks these set of contacts on this side, but it did what? It made them on that side. So it depends on whether you had it on your air conditioner or on your what? Heater. Uh, for a long time, they didn't do air conditioning and heat. It used to. It was a long time before we had air conditioning in the house. Anybody remember when we didn't have air conditioning? Yes. So what did we have? We had fans on. We had oh, yeah. window fans. And we stayed outside all the time. All the time. Uh, and we ran heat during the winter. That's the only time we used heat was during the winter. So this is the mercury switch. Now you're not going to see many of these uh, in new equipment because why? Mercury. Mercury is a carcinogen. Or I can't say that. Somebody say that for me. Carcinogen. Yeah, carcinogen. Thank you. Uh, and well, carcinogen basically. You buy it, no, you you can't. It's just like you can't buy a hundred watt. You cannot buy a hundred watt incandescent light bulbs anymore. They're they're out, they're out, they're outlawed. Uh, so you have to go to either fluorescent or LED because of the amount of energy a 100 watt light bulb uses. Uh, Every one you have in your house, right? I think the biggest one you can buy now is I think 60 watt and you can guess why would Because the amount of energy a 100 watt, but it's going to slowly phase out, guys. These incandescent bulbs are going to slowly phase out. As the LEDs, yeah, because they're not making as many of them. They're moving. In fact, we're moving from fluorescent over to LEDs. LEDs are a lot more efficient than fluorescent. And uh, since they've got really high, high intensity LEDs. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that and you can uh, that was a company that hired a bunch of our people that was actually going in and converting these guys over to the LEA. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, power. That's what he said. Money. Yeah, they are, but they but they last a lot, a lot. They last a lot longer too. Well, they do. They last a lot longer. They really do. Yeah. Really. And they've got the intensity up so much now that I saw a video where they was actually running at a ballpark. And they would put on music and the LEDs would flash to them. The, the big lights would flash. So you can't do that with gas bulbs, right? You know what I'm <laughs> so it's real neat. They was flashing, they, they, but LEDs, they don't care. You can turn them on. On and off, on and off. Yeah. You can put, but uh, the, the, the problem with mercury is that the molecules of mercury is smaller than the, than the actual pores in your skin. So if you handle mercury, it will absorb through your skin. So uh, it goes through your your sweat. There, huh? Yeah, LEDs. They're going to LEDs in street lights now. They're going to LEDs uh, in, in your red your red light. They're going to LEDs. Uh, you can tell them because you can see the individual stops. Uh, a lot of cars are going to headlights that are LED now. Uh, Car, his brake lights have been LED for quite a while. Now, now that they got the, uh, the lumens up real well. For years, we couldn't get a lot of lumens. And I can't remember his name, guys, but the guy that invented, they, they took years and years trying to develop a white LED. A white LED that put out white light. They could get a real light blue for years and you could still get flashlights and stuff that. Because you've got to have an LED. Uh, an LED wants to generate light at a certain color. So when you dope it with a certain, uh, uh, when you dope it or put the two semiconductors together, they emit a light at a certain wavelength. Well, white light is not at a certain wavelength. White light is over almost an infinite number of wavelengths. And trying to get a semiconductor that could simulate that was basically impossible. The guy that invented the white LED won the Nobel Prize in physics, by the way. So y'all could probably look him up. Thank goodness for him, because now we got white LEDs. And how it works, I have no idea, so don't ask the question. But however they dope that thing to set it up, it emits light in the, in the spectrum of white light. And like I said, for years, they got close with blue. And you can still see the cheaper, like flashlights and stuff, still have a blue blue tint to them. But now we got white lights there. So that's a mercury switch right there that you're looking at. And I'll I'll try to bring a, a reed switch over. So reed switch works on magnetics. And so what we got? We got two little contacts that are very close together. They're not exposed to a magnetic field. And the contacts are not closed, and you have an open across the reed. Uh, when we expose this thing to a magnetic field, and it's got to be in uh, this condition right here, so you can't put a south up there. If you put a south up there by itself, it don't work. If you put a north up there by itself, it don't work. So you've got to expose it to a north-south. And what happens is the north and the south is concentrating to this. The north is concentrating to this. And then one of those things comes there. What is north and south? Attracting those clouds. And then when you take the magnetic field away, it'll be what? Below. It don't care if you put a north south or a south north, it don't care. All you gotta do is make sure you put the different polarities on both sides. So what we can do is we can mount the reed switch itself is mounted permanently, and then somehow we mount a magnet to whatever you motion. And then when that thing comes up and crosses in front of that reed switch, it closes. And then when it, as soon as it moves away, it does what? Oh. Well, it's, it's for, yeah, what they've done over time, you two, on the, on the, on the on pneumatic cylinders are on cylinders. So we call these things cylinders because they're round. And then what we have is we have a piston inside here. And then we have a rod. 
And so what we have in, on what we call a double action cylinder is we have a valve, we have this on both sides. And what we do is if we put uh, fluid pressure on that side, what would it do? Push it this way, and then whatever you have over here would have to be exhausted. Everybody okay? Well, it's very important in an automated control system to know when that piston is in a certain location. So the speed and pneumatics is really critical. Calculating the speed of a pneumatic cylinder is really, really hard because pneumatics wants to uncompress and compress, right? You understand? So pneumatics are a lot more jerkier than a, than a high hydraulic system. But what we need to do is I tell this thing to extend, and then before I tell it to attract, I need to know when it's extended, right? You understand? So we need some type of sensor out there in an automated system. So what's automation? Automatic means we uh, we we produce something uh, with little or no human intervention. So I mean, we got we got to tell our computers that's running this thing or our control mm -hmm. system when these things are at certain positions. So that means I've got an I went, I need to know if I tell this thing to extend, I can't I can't say okay I'm gonna give this thing 30 seconds to extend, right? You understand? Because what if it gets what if it extends in 20 seconds? Well, what I've done is I've wasted 10 seconds, and I'm running 3,000 things a day. Now, now I'm wasting hours, right? You understand me? Or I can come out here and I, I tell it I'm going to wait 30 seconds, and it takes 40 seconds. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to retract it till it gets what? Fully extended, right? You understand? So that means I need a sensor out here and an automated system that make that I know when this thing is fully extended. So what they did for years is we'd put limit switches out here. So we'd put a little cam on here and we'd put a little limit switch right there. And when the thing extended, it would hit the limit switch and it'd say I'm extended, right? You understand? But now what could I do back here? I really can't, I can't tell when it's retracted because I can't pull it back in, right? So they would limit the stroke. So they would buy one that when they needed six inch worth of movement, they would buy one that would give us eight. And what they would do is they would, now they could put a sensor right here, but now the cylinder couldn't fully retract. And I was buying, I was buying a, I was buying a, a, a cylinder that was more expensive than what I needed. So they said, okay, what can we do? Well, what's nice about pneumatics is pneumatics, we can use, sometimes we can use plastic. Sometimes we can use uh, uh, aluminum. A lot of times they're made out of aluminum. Well, aluminum is non-ferrous, so that means a magnetic field would pass right through that. So what they do now on just about all your hydro pneumatic cylinders is there's a magnet attached to this thing. So now if I've got if I can come over here and put a sensor right here, and I can put a sensor right here, I'm, I got I'm gonna bring, let's bring the pipes up this way. Then what can I do? You can tell when it's fully extended or fully retracted. And by George, you go over here to our Festo line or our Amatro line, you're going to see all types of Hall effect sensors. Now you can't see this, so what they've got is the pneumatic cylinders have a magnet on. So now what I'm doing is I can sense when it's I can sense where it's fully retracted, or I can move these things. Uh, a lot of your cylinders have actually literally have mounts on them now. Well, we can put these little hall effect sensors on them. We can put them anywhere we want. So we can either detect when it's halfway out, or we can take we can stop it when it's halfway out, or vice versa. So it gives us the ability to do that, right? Uh, just about all alarms that you put on your house, you put these sensors on your house uh, that determines when your windows is open, and those are probably what they're Hall effect sensors, guaranteed. The magnet is in motion. So what we do is we put the magnet in motion, right? You understand? So it's on the actuator. It's on whatever's moving. And then we, and then the sensor, the Hall effect sensor, would be mounted stationary. So we can use these definitely to, to sense proximity. We can't sense position, but we can sense when it's at a certain spot, right? You understand? So we could go over there, and when we go over there at the end of the semester, and we start pointing out these hall, these, these reed switches, you're going to say, and we'll count them off, and you'll see these use a lot in pneumatics. Hard to do it in the hydraulics, and why is that? Huh? 
because hydraulics, the, the, the cylinders can't usually are not aluminum, they're usually steel. And the problem with steel is the magnetic field would be concentrated to the field and it can't get it out. So we have to sense hydraulics better, but you're going to see a lot of pneumatics used in, uh, used in, uh, in, in automated systems. We use hydraulics. Hydraulics, of course, is used in liquids. And what advantages does hydraulics have over pneumatics? Can be more precise, right? Because uh, as soon as the as soon as the cylinder uh, as so, on pneumatics, as soon as that we generate enough force to cause it to move, and it moves, the the the, the uh, air is going to uncompress, and it's got to do what? Compress back. So we got to do certain things to try to keep uh, hydraulic cylinder, pneumatic cylinders from being jerky. Fluid power, guys, uh, we have a formula where you can calculate the speed of a hydraulic cylinder and it's going to be exactly right because the fluid is non-compressible. We consider it to be non-compressible. So as soon as you want to use it, you use it. As soon as you try to use pneumatics, it's going to try to uncompress and you got to do what recompress it. Also, what we can do with uh, fluids, I mean liquids, is we can compress them up to extremely high pressure. Uh, like the outcraft uh, that I was working on, uh, the P3s, their hydraulic pumps run, run at 300 pounds of pressure, run at P 300 psi, 3,000 psi. What did I say? Uh, and you calculate the amount of force. Anybody know the formula for force? It's area times what? Pressure. So what we could do is 3,000 psi. I could push that against the area of one square inch and generate 3,000 pounds of force. So what a big advantage of um, of, of uh, liquids is that your actuators can be real small to generate a lot of force. Uh, fluid or uh, uh, pneumatics, we usually ran these things at about what? Your house usually run yours at about what? 70 psi or, or 90 psi. The problem we have with gases is the more you compress them, the more water they release. And what's the gas we usually use in pneumatics? Air. And we got a lot of air. We got a lot of water in air, right? Uh, if you look up, it, it could tell you how much, how many cubic uh, feet or, uh, of, of water a certain amount of air could hold. But what happens when you compress it? You lose cubic feet of air and you can't hold the water anymore. So what does it do? It releases it. So and using air in a in a hydraulic system, we gotta have something. We gotta do something about that water because they're constantly doing one. Yeah, we well we have drains on them. You never get into a pneumatic system where they don't have a loop somewhere and have a drain on it, right? So you can do what you can drain the water out, and we have filters all over the place that not only filter out the dirt but also they filter out the water. We gotta do that all the time on a pneumatic system. Well that's if you don't fill if you don't get rid of it. Uh, they'll they'll run it through chillers. We have different ways. We can we run it through a chiller and chill it down and if you chill if you if you chill the air down even after it's been compressed it's going to release water also right you see that every every day on the dew on the ground so there's a lot of ways you can try to get rid of the water uh, but normally on a home uh, we just drain our tank every once in a while we try to by the way water is uncompressible so what happens is when your tank starts filling up you can't store as much air in there so uh, you need to drain that out every So yeah, we use these guys all the time uh, in in burglar alarm system, in pneumatic system. You'll run into these things a lot, uh, you know. But all I got to do is is just put no matter what I'm doing, like a carriage or something. I'm trying to sense when it's at a certain position. Well, if I use a limit switch, a limit switch is a contact sensor, which means it's electromechanical, which means there's what two things that can fail. I can take that thing, I can take that same thing, instead of putting that little hump out there that my limit switch is against, I can take a magnet and put it out there, right? Come over here and put a reed switch out there, and now I have a no contact sensor that can do exactly the same thing as a limit switch. But instead of just using a metal <coughs> cam out there that the limit switch hits, now I would replace it with a what? A magnet. 
So it you lasts see, longer too. Well, but yeah, it lasts longer because it's not an electro. Well, that's not true. A, a reed switch is electromechanical, but it's not. But the but the reed itself, the switch is is in a vacuum, which means it's very low stress. We can still put too much current through these things and cause the uh, cause the contacts to weld together. And guys, when this guy gets off center, I mean, all it's got to do is just get off center a little bit, and those contacts will open back up because they got a spring tension to them, right? You understand? So basically, this magnetic field's got to be pretty much well centered before it does what it closes. And I'll bring some of these out. I got two really cool. That's all I can say is I'm sorry. And that's the problem with teaching classes in two different buildings is you got to remember why. Got to remember to bring all your stuff over here. So I teach, we do sensors in the, we do a sensor review in the AUT 208 class, and that's the last class I taught. And one of my, one of my things didn't get back in my case. So these are examples of re-switches. So you don't know if they're re-switches. Uh, the only way you can really tell if it's a re-switch, you only have two wires. All of them are three wires. I'll take all three. Because we ain't got that, huh? Yeah. All. You just have to. Well, I'm not gonna say all. I I have a problem using the term all. <laughs> so then you get out there and you find one that's got three because it's got a it's got two contacts in there. We rich said it only has two. Normally, I use that term a lot. Normally, uh, or usually, these guys will have. Predominantly, would be another word. Really, these guys only have two wires. Well, these are. What's that? One on each side. Yeah, just one on each side. Yeah, now the, the dry contact. The, yeah, the dry contact. This is what we call the reed switch. The other one, so we, the dry contact, we call that the reed switch. The mercury contact, we people call that a mercury switch. And so what they do is they give it that those two names, even though technically they're they're both what we call reach switches, but they have their own names to differentiate. Now the problem with mercury switches is for they they put it they have to put it in an insulator. They might be in a ceramic it could be in a ceramic outside, but the mercury switch will never be in a metal container. Because now you got metal for metal and you can't wouldn't be able to sense, right? You understand? So normally it's either in glass or ceramic. Now the problem with glass or ceramic is you can do what with both of them. Break them, you know. And if you break these things, then that mercury's out there. You and shine up a dime. Or shine up a dime. Shine up a sign up your mother's uh, gold wedding band too. You'll take your mother's gold wedding band and turn it silver. My dad used to bring mercury home. We used to play with that thing. And this is a true story. And my mom went over there to clean it up and got it on her gold wedding band and it just sucked it up and turned her wedding band silver. Oh, so who's in the dog house? <laughs> it wasn't my daddy, even though she did get fussed at. It was us because we're the one that played with it. Uh, can you even, do they have those mercury? Are they just grandfathered in or they're not making them? No, as far as I know, they're not making any mercury switches anymore. But what you got to understand, if you go to work in an industry, especially oh, yeah, like, a, yeah. like an old company, like the U.S. Steels and stuff like that, Industry has a tendency, for some reason, not to replace things that's working. And well, so, well, if you go to work at an old company like CMC Scale or U.S. Steel, you're going to run into modern stuff, and you're going to run into antiquated stuff. In my, and, you, and it's in you if you're a technician. Old, 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 dry stuff, but you want to keep them because they still use well, they them. still work perfect, you know, and, and, and people don't understand that, you know, they get that, well, it's still got all this old stuff, but the old stuff is being, being paid for, right? You understand? And it's, and it's nothing doing, it's nothing but making them people money. Now, why would you go out and replace something that's making you money with something that's going to cost you money? A company would not do that. Right. And so we got a lot of new companies around here. But you go to work at Flexing Gate and stuff like that in a, in, you know, in, in 10 mm -hmm. years, they're going to have a lot of old equipment in there. Uh, if they, if they can still meet the specifications mm -hmm. of the employer, uh, the more tight the specifications come, then they might have to update. So I think I told y'all, uh, 
Broza is going to give us a sec are going to give us a manufacturing one. Broza is going to give us a manufacturing one. They're going to come in. It's going to donate it to the college. You're going to be able to work on it. That's a hundred dollar question. I tell them they need to make sure it works. They need to send people out here and make sure it works before they leave. So when we got our robots, the panic robots, the big panic robots over there, they just came in here and put them in. And so what do we have to do? I had to figure out how to make them work. And they had all these sensors and all this stuff that was out there, and they just cut the wires on them. And we had to figure out what we needed to jump out. So it took us about a year to get the panic going. It wasn't because it, it took a year. Uh, it runs off 440, and we only had one 440 source over there, and we've got, we've got two 440 robots. One of them was, is the ABV. So the problem is, is that when we ran, when we taught the classes, we had to disconnect the big panic so we could teach our classes, right? You understand? So the only time we got to fool around with it was between semesters. Uh, photoelectric sensor. I love it. I like I like taking stuff that and figure out. Photoelectric guys. And this is uh, I don't know. We might. I, I I've been thinking about that. We might go back and let y'all redo the limit switch lab because you're going to run into limit switches out there. I mean, you're. It's just. Proof. It's just that now you'll see a lot more pilot duty. I mean, I'm sorry, electronic duty than you do. You'll see the big guys because normally what you're going to see <coughs> is the limit switch is going to input into a program logic pro, and then we're going to move into non-contact sensors, another non-contact sensor. Then we got a whole group of photoelectric, a whole group. So we got different types. And we use these guys all over the place. The only disadvantage that we have with photoelectric sensors is they work off light. So we got to work these in a pretty clean environment, right? That makes sense. Uh, but what, if you go into the, into the automated manufacturing plants like, like uh, Mercedes, the cement plant in Mercedes, the flex engage, you're going to see these guys are now what? Real clean. It's just like if you go into a, uh, dealers repair shop. I mean, those sometimes those things they've been working on cars and it's just beautiful inside there, right? So we do a lot of cleanness. You go to work at if you go to work at U.S. Steel. I don't know if you see a lot of uh, photo detectors because it's a very very making steel is very dirty. Even melting steel is very dirty. Right? So the first one that we'll look at is what we call a through the beam. The book calls it a direct scan. So this one is in the textbook. And you see how I got the name through the beam. So what we have is we have a transmitter on one side, then we have a receiver on the, uh, the other. We shoot a light beam through it. So right now, if it's not detecting anything, the output of this guy will be true. You understand that? And what happens is what we're trying to detect it moves through the gear and does what? Breaks the beam. So when the output of this guy goes false, it indicates something's in between the beam. Does that make sense? These guys are really high, high, high speed. We can use these as counters. Uh, we can put the counters. We can use them for the but What you got to remember, <coughs> if you're programming a PLC, is that you'd have to use a normally con uh, close contact for this thing because they, op they, op they operate opposite, right? So it gives us back a true when it don't detect something, and then it gives us back a false when something comes up in question. <laughs> yeah, PLC would use a normally close contact program. But you know, that's probably something usually just moving towards. Well, it could be, or we could use it to stop things. I, I'll bring our conveyor oh, yeah, belt yeah, over. Okay. Uh, we could use it to stop yeah. it when it gets to a certain position. We could use it to count things when it goes flying by. And these guys are fast. They're they're light. 
they're using photo transistors and LEDs out uh, in, inside there. They're real fast. You can see these cans flying past these things. I mean, they're flying past. And every time they fly past, we'll, be, well, we'll get a pulse and we can use that in, into, into a counter, into a counter. How long it is because every time it opens the beam, your counter will go. Yeah, it goes back every time. So what we do now is right now that no close contact would be closed when this guy here is off, right? I'm saying that's what we're saying. So it would be closed when this guy here is off, and when it opens, so every time something goes by, you get pain. Are we okay? This is called a through the beam, which is what I learned it. The book calls it the direct scan. I don't forgot what page it's on. This is one of the first ones that the book talks about. And they got a lot of these little unique, nice pictures in there. What page is it on, guys? Direct scan. Oh, about my book is in I'll, A photoelectric sensor. Four sixty nine. What which version do you have? Four. Four. Uh, fourth edition. I think we're on the fifth edition. <clears throat> now what he did when he went to the fifth edition is basically he left everything in there, but he broke the chapters down, so it has a lot of chapters. <laughs> This is uh this is one of the sensors we're using. This is called a retro reflector. We have several of these on manufacturing. This works sort of like a through the beam, but what you have if you have your uh, your uh, unit, your transmitter and your receiver is in the same unit. So normally we call these transceivers. Receivers. So it's kind of a combination of two words. So you hear the word transceiver, it means it's a device that has both your wide and the same unit. And a transmitter receiver. So what we do on this guy is we have our transmitter. It shoots a beam over, hits a reflector, and then what does it do? Now it's back. So it works kind of like a through the beam. So as long as there's not an object, it, we would get a true back, right? You understand? But what happens here is your object moves between your transmitted light and your reflected light and breaks the beam. And it works exactly like a through the beam. But here we just got one transmitter and then we got a retro reflector. Now what is a retro reflector? Yeah, a retro reflector, if you actually blew it up, it's going to be little thousands of little triangles. And each, tri each triangle is reflective. So what happens is it, it, has a, it, it reflects back to the source. So the source does not have to be directly in front of it. But like if I used a mirror and I had a slight angle, then what's going to happen? Yeah, then we'll miss our receiver. Uh, what happens on a retro reflector, if I come in and hit it at this angle, it bounces back at the same angle over a viewable area. It's not infinite. And we see retro reflectors all the time. You know, people wear these vests. And so here I am driving my car, 
somebody's on the side of the road, my lights are shining like this, but I see a what? I see the reflection because it's retro reflection. Uh, there's a retro reflector up on the moon. So now they know exactly how far the moon is. They can actually measure the distance to the moon. And uh, you know what they found out, right? It's moving away so many centimeters every year. And so eventually we're going to lose our moon. It's not going to be in our lifetime or our grandchildren's lifetime. I hope it happens. I'll be long gone, but eventually uh, we're going to lose our moon. That's going to be drastic, right? Because no, it, no tides. Yeah, yeah they're going to send a rocket up there. You know. Yeah, I think, yeah, we might have a might have a Death Star right up there. Uh, the big advantage. So here we got one Sentinel. We had one out at USC. It was it went out like a hundred yards. Using retro. No, it, I'm sorry, it was through the beam. So the, the biggest advantage of through the beam is that it has a lot yeah. distance. We can put them a lot further apart because uh, what we're doing, so if my beam, if I got a good beam back over 100 feet, and we could do 100 feet right here, a retro reflector would be limited to 50 feet because the light's got to do what? Got to go back and come back, right? And so what they put on the moon. They put a retro reflector up there, but they shoot a laser up there, and then they can measure how long it takes to come back. But they don't—the laser does not have to be perfectly aligned, right? You understand? <clears throat> which it which it was if it was a mirror. So if it was a through the beam, it would be a lot. They could put it out a lot further, but it'd be hard to mount another sensor on the other side. So we didn't say that we couldn't get long range out of it. Out of the retro reflector, it's just that if I use the same uh, sensing elements, then the the uh, through the beam will be further. But now I've got to have a transmitter on one side, and I got to wire up the receiver on the other right here. All I got to do with a, with a retro reflector is just wire up, hook up the electronics to one side, right? We have a lot of these over there on the manufacturing line. We have a lot of retro reflector sensors on both the Festo and the Amco line. Yeah, and that's the problem with any light source. So uh, these guys don't work good with transparent devices. We never <laughs> use uh, we never use these to detect glass right. uh, because or or if we have a highly reflective surface, uh, a highly reflective surface would work okay with through the beam because. It's not the receipt, even if it bounces back, it's still breaking the beam. But a fuse sensor is going to be dealing, this guy is going to be dealing with if we get a highly reflective surface, that could cause a problem. Because if it causes enough to, to reflect back, then it could sense that, uh, that it, it's not there. So yeah, it's a certain material. Uh, uh, this would, this would define on what sensor, when you're designing these things, what sensor you would, you would use. If I was going to use a lot of reflective devices and I was trying to sense it, I wouldn't use this guy. I'd use another another sensor. Right? That makes sense. So that's a really good question. Uh, that's a good point. So we okay? Even the next one, we have a problem with what 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 material we use. So if I was using a red beam and I had a red surface, we might run into a problem, right? Because it would be reflecting all that red light. Back. If I had a green surface or a black surface, it would be about that. So a lot of uh, lots of uh, this one we use a lot too. This is called a uh, diffuse, and this is this really depends on color. Uh, because here, the darker the color is, the less reflection you get. So what we do with the diffuse sensor is we actually bounce it off the object itself. So the amount of light we get back from the object, right? And just about everything reflects light, but this guy would have a color with, you know, dark, the darker the color, the less light it would get back. Uh, the lighter the color, the more light it would get back. And sometimes we use that principle. Well, over on the Festo line, we got a, we got a, we, we, we have three different colors. We have black, we have red, and we have metal. 
and we can adjust our, re our retro reflector so it don't see black. So now we know when it's not black. Now all we got to do is figure out if it's metal or red, and we'll look and see how they do that in a minute. So uh, the, when the robot picks up a, a piston, if you looked at the piston that it picks up for the cylinders, it's got one that's got a little small bore to it, and it's got one that's got a, um, it's got another one's got a big bore. Uh, both your red and your uh, metal get the big ones. And the black one gets a small one. So when you watch the robot, the robot will go over there and dip down and look at the cylinder. It's adjusted so it don't see black. So now it knows to go over there and pick up the small bore, right, and put it in the cylinder. If it gets reflection back, it says, okay, well, it's either red, it's either red or, or metal, and those get the same bore, and it'll go up there and pick up one of the big pistons and come over and put it in that. So we use that application sometimes deliberately. And then on down the line, we're using a retro, we're using this guy diffused that sees everybody. Well, what we're using is we're using sensors that we can, we can, we can, we can adjust the threshold when it senses. So some of them are adjusted to see black. Some of them are, some of the diffuse sensors are adjusted to see black. Some of them are adjusted not to see black. Does that make sense? Because there's no such thing as black. <laughs> So black would it reflect absolutely no light. We cannot get perfect black. We cannot get a perfect black. So what does that mean? That means we can adjust it so it can see the black shades that we use. Well, actually, what we get is we get real dark gray. Right? So photoelectric sensors, this is not your book, this is out of another book. I mean we use these guys all over the place. The only the only thing you gotta worry about is the cleanliness. And sometimes I think they said that one of the guys says uh, that's part of their preventive maintenance because they go out with a rag and they want to just clean these things off. But these guys it's just like the car, it's just like your windshield in your car. You know, on the inside, which is not exposed to the dirt, it gets it gets stuff on it, right? You have to come in every once in a while and clean that off. So all these guys usually will, will have to have someone to come in and clean, clean them every day. Clean this week is you don't worry about it. And what's nice about these guys, guys, is these guys uh, can really be sealed up. I mean, we can really seal them up. Well, we can seal them up really well, right? And, and which means we can run these guys in really harsh environments that we can't run lemon switches. Lemon switches has inputs in them. You got you got a you got a hole in the bottom that you gotta do what? You gotta get your wire through. And of course we seal that thing up. The first time somebody comes out and works on it, they don't leave that off. I seen I've seen covers left off of the switches before. Because it's just an inconvenience for they work on it a lot. It's just an inconvenience to leave the cover off the limit switch. Now you got all type of noise to get through that. So limit switches you have to be you have to really <coughs> monitor those things and keep up with them because there's all types of holes that what the garbage can get in. We can still these guys do that. But so we can run these in pretty harsh environments. All we gotta do is just keep them clean, clean, clean. But we don't have to worry about exposed. I've seen them down in liquids before not cause any problem. Now there's a variation of this that the book doesn't talk about. And it's a it's a uh, diffuse sensor, but it's called a definite reflective diffuse sensor. And I don't think I've got that in here. But basically, what they do on that, it depends on reflective light. But what they do is they mount the transmitter and they mount the receiver at angles with each other. So what happens if if the object is at a certain distance? It will do what? It will hit the receiver. If it's too close, then what would happen? It would bounce up into here and miss the receiver. If it's too far away, then it would do what? Then it would bounce that way and miss the receiver. So these definite reflective diffuse sensors, these guys are sensing something, but when they're at, but it's at it, not only is it a certain place, it's also at a what? Certain distance, yeah, certain distance. Well, like I said, you can go over there. If you got an optical mouse, you can pick that sucker off the top of that surface just a hair and it don't do what anymore it don't work because now it's 
is bouncing back and missing the receiver. And that's called a definite reflected, I mean, a, a definite reflected diffuse sensor. Is what I was referring to there. So the diffuse sensor, what are we going to have problems with? We're going to have problems with color, right? Understand that. So this is going to dictate where we use these things. Uh, we got to work with transparent devices because the light would just fly right through them and wouldn't reflect back at all, right? Instead of, would work okay with any re reflective surface, like you was talking about, Anthony. This guy, if it was a reflective surface, it wouldn't care, right? And, uh, you get a lot of reflective light back. Uh, so this guy, if it don't sense something, it gives a false back, and when it senses something, it gives a truth. So this works opposite of the water, of the retro reflective and the through the beam. So through the beam, we get a false back when it detects something, and we get a tr true back when it don't detect it, right? You understand that? And we bring that up if you were programming it into a PLC. So we got diffuse sensors on both lines, we have retro reflective sensors on both lines, and we have through the beam sensors. So at the end of the term, we're going to go over and we've got to identify all these different sensors that we go over in class. And I know I skipped over one of those grades for you. But how about it? If you need to finish up your lab, that's when you're going to do it, right? Say, okay, some of y'all are already through. Justin's already through it. He's not here today anyway. Uh, what's, what's real popular is uh, is to mount the actual transmitter and receiver away from danger and then actually use uh, fiber optics to transmit it over to the actual sensor. That way we're not putting our sensor or sensor unit in indirect contact <coughs> with manufacturing just because we think that's a mechanic. Right? And a lot of times, huh? No, it's just, it's got, it's, uh, this one's got two wires going through it, so this would be for a diffuse detector. So what it's got is it's got, it's got one guy that's sensing the light, and it's got another one that's using the uh, receiver. But it's transmitting light back and forth back to the actual sensor, which is somewhere else. Okay, you understand? So this is not the sensor, this is the sensing element, and it could actually be mounted out. Uh, a lot of times they use plastic fiber. Plastic fiber is good for about uh, 500 meters, which would be about 330 meters, which is a pretty good distance, right? Anything above that, we would probably have to go to the glass fiber, which you can also just have. But plastic fiber is really cheap. Uh, so if something happens, I can very, I can replace this cheaply. If something hit hit my actual sensing unit, right? What would happen? That would cost a lot of money. So you'll see a lot of fiber. Well, no, it, it, you have to understand. If I had a chunk of, an, of aluminum was that was, was that thick, could you bend it? Can you bend aluminum foil? So the thinner I make the glass, the more flexible it becomes. So we can use glass fiber. It's fiber, but it's it's thinner than a human hair. You can eat, yeah, definitely on the ground over long distances. Yeah. Uh, fi uh, glass fiber is rated in kilometers. I mean, we're talking single mode fiber is like good, right? Well, the problem we use is they use glass because they over, they go over long distance and they're doing a lot of bandwidth. Here in industry, in industry, we're dealing with trues and falses, right? You understand? And, uh, and, and, uh, and glass is hard to turn glass. It's hard to terminate, which means you know you know every conductor has eventually come to an end. What's what's the function of a conductor? To carry stuff, right? From from one place to the next. And once it from something to something. So eventually that conductor is gonna to have to be terminated. So the act of bringing a conductor to an end we call termination. Uh, glass is real hard to terminate. So we got classes, and if you take uh, the uh, cable splice and insulation class, we deal, if you can terminate glass, you can terminate plastic. 
So plastic, we just basically can take a pair of diagonal cutters. We can cut it, take some sandpaper, and sand it off flush, and then we're okay. A glass, you can't do that. Glass, we have to scribe it, we have to break it, we have to sand it. We, we can fusion splice it, which means melting them together. So it's a lot harder to work with, but it has a it has a lot lower attenuation, has a lot higher bandwidth, which means we can send glass a lot further. And, and at higher speeds. So a phone company uses glass. And you can see the little trailer every once in a while. You ever seen a little trailer? When it's all air conditioned, they'll get in there and they'll pull the cables in. They're in there splicing inside their little controlled environment. So you gotta be pretty clean with glass because if you get dirt on the end, you gotta be fine. Plastics really is a tremendous thing. I still thought you thought it was a luxury for the worker. What's that? No, it's in there to terminate that, those fibers. Well, they use a lot of fiber in their trunks, trying to get it from point A to point B, and then they'll come into a, a unit that converts it over to fiber for electrical, and everybody gets electrical to their house, right? But they're big trunks going from city to city, and municipality to municipality to do it through fiber. So, good question. So plastic is, is uh, really neat. I'll bring some plastic fiber over here. It's the neatest stuff, uh, the way light travels down there. You can, you can actually roll it up and see the light. Light travels through this stuff. It's pretty neat. I'll bring some glass over too and let you look at the size of that. You gotta be careful with glass. Because glass doesn't biodegrade. And it's very, very small. You just take it in your finger. You know, you have to get it out. It's not gonna rot, it's not gonna rot out there for you know, you get a piece of wood in your finger, eventually it's going to do well. Yeah, it's going to come out, it's going to be great. You get that stuff in your eyes, you know. So I'll bring some fiber, I'll try to remember to bring some fiber, uh, some plastic fiber, and I'll throw some glass fiber. In. You're not going to run into glass that much in the industry. Uh, that's not true. The mines use a lot of glass because they got to send information over long distances. You know, it really surprises me. You know, we see you see a hole in the ground and the elevator goes down, but then they get in that they get in a train car or something and they drop miles underground, right? So they they run a lot of fiber. Uh, glass fiber, they use a lot of glass fiber, right? So we gotta protect the glass. Uh basic detection, we've already looked at this a little bit. We can use uh of course these days. Uh, the output and running into a watch, voltage divider. Uh, we can run it. This would be a photo diode. I mean, I'm sorry, a photo transistor. Uh, this would be a photovoltaic cell or a solar cell. Uh, that would be the way we would hook up a photo diode. And so what we're doing is we're taking it directly into an amplifier. So the photo diode. The problem with the photo diode is you're going to have to amplify it because you cannot use nanoamps, right, to give you the work. So we, as soon as we get through there, we're running into an amplifier, uh, an operational amplifier, by the way. These guys will give us a lot of gain, but that's the second circuit that you have to add to that. Where we can do, for the phototransistor, we can do a lot. We can actually get a load directly off the sensor itself, right? We can get a lot of current in. So these are just uh, basic methods of taking the uh, inputs and outputs of these different sensors and then uh, convert them over to voltage. The only one that we have so far that gives us a voltage is the photovoltaic cell, right? And the solar cell. This is the technical name right here. So most of y'all learned it. The commercial name is what? So it's photoresistor. That's the technical name. Most people know it as a, as a one. No, they, they call these solar panels, but most, like most of them call it photodiodes. Photo cells, I'm sorry. So you ever hear the term photo cell? That's usually a photo resistor. Yeah. Yeah. That's the amplifier circuit that's following the uh, diode and photo solar cell. Yeah. Uh, we've been dealing with amplifiers so long, especially voltage amplifiers, uh, that it would make sense that sooner or later, so used to, if you looked inside your car radio, you'd see hundreds of transistors. See all these pieces of the amplifier. Now, if you open up a, a radio since they've been around so long, you're going to see one big integrated circuit in there. 
So what they do, of course, is if we, if we got the same electronic circuit that we use over and over and over and over and over again, eventually somebody's going to say, well, let's see if we can figure out if we can take that whole circuit and integrate it into a single way for make an integrated circuit. Well, amplifiers have been around for years. We used to, we used to and we still do. Uh, we do a lot of, especially to get a lot of current gain. Uh, we need some nice big steel transistors. So on these big power amplifiers, you're still going to see a lot of transistors. But on these guys that all we need a good voltage gain out of, we're not going to try to get much current out of. We use a device called an operational amplifier. And this has hundreds of transistors, but it's all on the wall. On a single wafer. And all we do, guys, is we, if these guys are usually in, in, in eight pin packs. Normally we have two pins coming up here. One of them would be uh, uh, for power, would be for plus, one of them would be for minus. Uh, then we have, uh, we have two inputs. Uh, we would have the uh, non inverting, the inverting, and then we have an output. And then sometimes we put some resistors out to bias it. To set the operation parameters of the way it works. But so when I, I could do this with transistors or I could go out and buy an op amp. And then I come out and I could set the gain. The ratio between these two transistors, these guys right there sets the gain of this thing. If I wanted, uh, the gain of this guy right here is, uh, this is an inverting, is, uh, R, R out, which would be this guy divided by R in. So if I wanted if I wanted a voltage gain of ten, I could use a ten K right there, a one K right there, and I've I've designed a transistor amplifier. But it don't we can't get a lot of current out of it, we can get voltage out of it, right? And so, so I can take the output of these little voltages, you know, little voltages, and I can get twenty four volts just like that by using an operational amplifier. And we can use it as a comparator too. I mean, we can wire an operational amplifier. So an operational amplifier can run as a comparator, it can run as an amplifier. We can gain it, we can calculate gains, we can set input resistance and output resistance just by using a couple of resistors. And if you actually took these things and look at the circuitry, it's a very complex circuitry, but I don't care. All I need to know is how do I, how do I bias it? You know, how do, how, how can I set the gain? And it's very, very easy. Uh, this is what we call an inverting amplifier, which means if this guy puts out a positive voltage, this guy's going to swing one. Negative. If I did a, if I did a non-inverting, the formula changes a little bit. So AB, which would be the voltage gain for, for inverting would be R out of R in. For a non-inverting, uh, AB would be R out over R in plus one. But they're almost the same. But setting the gain on these things is two, two resistors, two resistors. And all, all I gotta do is figure out how to place those resistors. And I can set whatever voltage gain I want. So these guys are going to be in, going to be in little 18, 8 pin dips, little 18, 8 little 8 pin dips. Or they're going to be integrated into a bigger circuit, but we use operational amplifiers. So they've been around so long that eventually somebody figure out how to do what? Integrated on there. I got four, I got 8 pins. Some of them's not even used. One, two, three, four, five. I'm sorry. One, two, three, four, five. So three of the pins are going in here. Uh, another one, another one, the 741 uses two pins so we can set an offset. Yeah, these guys are really 741. 741's, 741's, 301's, LN741's, LN301's, you're going to run into a lot of those because they're, for an engineer, they're ideal because they don't have to really do well. Very easy for, for you to design circuits. So, anybody, any other questions? Good point. So, yeah, these op amps, we can use them. So, these are called operational amplifiers, but every operational amplifiers, but just about everybody calls them what? Yeah. Um, and they don't give us a, uh, they don't give us a current, a big current gain. They give us a lot. Voltage gain. They're, they're, they're voltage amplifiers. But then I can take the output of this and run it into a current amplifier, right? You understand. Now when we say voltage amplifiers, you have to understand these guys don't generate that voltage. They get it from a thing we call a, a power supply. A 
A lot of people think power amplifiers generate power. They just manage the power that's already available. Okay. All right. So if y'all want to finish up your uh, your uh, resistor lab, I mean your pot lab, I'll go over there. I don't think Jackson wants to do that. He's already cut out, and I told him he could do it. But we need to get it finished up today because we'll come back in here, and the first lab we're going to do is going to be on. Uh, I think I'll I think I'll pull that limit switch lab out and let y'all uh, let y'all.